So as evidence, there's much that we can uh, talk and uh, share, uh, but uh, time is moving on. Um, just as we've heard from Chris that his uh, much of his recovery has been done through uh, the experience of writing his book. Uh, my relationship with uh, Stefan Grenier goes back some 13 years when we worked together in LFCA, Land Force Central Area Headquarters. And um, so I've known him since then. I knew at that time, at the, these very early days after his return from Rwanda, his experience, that he was hurting, and hurting real bad. And uh, I've watched him go through his path and walk that path to recovery. And uh, just as Chris Linford is um, continuing to serve, having served, and will continue to serve and make the sacrifice after uh, out of the uniform, so too has uh, Stefan Grenier. Um, he too has uh, sacrificed much on behalf of Canadians, as has his family. And he has continued and continues now to this day. And looking at the application of, of everything he's learned in his recovery process and how he can migrate that to talking to uh, industry and corporations and other government organizations and the private sector to, uh, to police, to fire services, to emergency services, everybody that's faced with this issue of PTSD. Um, Field Marshal Slim said that uh, everyone only has, I'm paraphrasing, only has uh, so much gas in their tank. And uh, that tank runs out. And that's when you hit the wall. And uh, so it's, a, it's an issue that, that we're all faced with. So we're going to look at, uh, and I've asked uh, Stefan to share what he's doing now in his continuing service uh, to Canada and to Canadians. Uh, that is very much a part of his long life recovery. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, my great friend, Stefan Grenier. Thank you. I'm not used to standing behind a, uh, a lectern. Is this what you call it, a lectern? Something like that. Pulpit. It's not a podium, it's a pulpit. 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 Yeah. All right. But I, I'm told I have to stand here. I, I'm gonna, I feel trapped. Uh, so, listen, I haven't focused, uh, contrary to the introduction, I haven't focused on PTSD in three years now. My focus has been elsewhere, uh, but I'm going to make it up as I go today, okay? Uh, no, I'm going to present to you how I think this, this path is leading into the future now and how we can uh, transform the way society deals with this problem one workplace at a time because my belief is that we spend the majority of our, well that's not my belief, it's a fact. We spend the vast majority of our time at work. Wouldn't it make sense if the workplaces that we work in were to be the transformative tool that society uses in the place to actually change the way we as a society deal with these issues? Um, a few things I'd like to pick up on before, and then I'll shrivel this up, throw it in the corner, and get to my, the, the PowerPoint. We'll be speed dating on PowerPoint today. Uh, you're probably very intelligent people. I'm going to fast track through some stuff, but Chris tells me it's available online afterwards, so if you need to read stuff. I have some sources down at the bottom left that you won't be able to read here today, but you can pick it up on the website later. But a couple of things I'd like to, to pick on. And, you know, I had never met Chris never heard him speak, but I have to say at one point when he read the later letter to, uh, from uh, his daughter, I had water coming out of my eyes. Uh, that happens to me every once in a while. I think that there's a term for that, it's called crying. Uh, I discovered that when I came back from Rwanda. Before Rwanda, I, hadn't, I never had water coming out of my eyes. And after Rwanda, I had water coming out of my eyes all the time, wondering what was wrong with me. What was my major dysfunction? But impact on family, absolutely. I wrote a letter to uh, Romeo Dallaire not too long ago. Uh, he and I stay in touch quite a bit. And he was sending me stuff to do. And I, I, I realized I couldn't do it anymore. I, I couldn't read Chris's books, let's say, to recommend Romeo Dallaire endorse the book, not Chris's book in particular. But I just couldn't do that anymore because it, it was just 
not healthy for me. So I wrote him a nice letter saying, listen, sir, I want to support you, but I, I, I can't do this kind of task anymore. And in my letter to him, I, I told him, I said, you know, my family has finally made the, 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 the final turn. You know, my wife and I split up. It's not a bad split up. It's a very civilized separation. We talk every day. Um, glad to see you're still together. But the casualties of this issue just ripple out like a rock thrown in water and the ripples keep going and going and going. And so there's a lot of dialogue between my wife and I, but we just know that the damage is so deep that we need to take a break. So I don't know what the future holds, but I just wanted to acknowledge the very important work you're doing, Chris, at acknowledging the impact on families. Uh, the second thing I would like to uh, talk about, and it's very connected to what Chris spoke at last, suicide, and which is probably where the most damage with my spouse was done, is when she walked, when she walked in as I was about to commit suicide. And the impact that that had on her, that keeled her over. It's not, you know, I never became a wife beater. I never became an alcoholic. Uh, I'm, no perf I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But it's when she walked in on me that day that completely broke her. She had been, like your spouse and, and us, you know, dealing with this issue for 19 years now. At the time, <clears throat> I won't tell you when she walked in on me because that will give away when it happened. And I don't want you to know that right now. Uh, but that really keeled her over. From a health perspective, you know, uh, terrible to walk in on that. And so the impact, uh, you know, 17, 15, 20 years later, keep, keep being felt. And I just want to share something with you from a, a, a suicidality point of view. You know, as Chris said to you earlier, we, we all have our opinions about suicide. And before I became who I am now, I, I, I heard opinions about people who commit suicide, you know, and, and the, the polarity of the opinions are that they're either cowards because they leave people behind, or they're very brave. You have to be brave to kill yourself. I mean, or, or, or you're a coward. And really, you know, there's a bunch of opinions in between, but those are the kind of polar opposites of, of each other. And I got to tell you, when I was committing suicide, um, I didn't feel either. I didn't feel like a coward. I didn't feel brave. I felt relief. That's how I felt. I felt a tremendous sense of relief that finally, th th this is it. And it's, it's, it's very interesting because the, you know, the suicide note was written on my Blackberry, not that Blackberry, but a, an older one. The email was going out to the police. So the police would come and deal with me before Julie found me. Uh, everything was done. The rope was there. Everything was, everything was set up. The plan was in action. And as I was just about to, you know, get up, press send, and then hang myself, my wife walks in on me. Uh, total surprise. But I just wanted to share with you that if there's work that needs to be done in this country, it is around suicidality. Because I tell you, those fridge magnets and those suicide trainings that we give to people and that we receive... We know statistically, scientifically, the empirical evidence is out. All the suicide intervention training in the world has not, to this date, reduced suicidality in this country, or America, or around the world. And we keep thinking, and of course we need to keep doing this, because we, what's the next best thing? So we have to keep doing what we know we can do now, which is provide suicide intervention training. And I'm not against suicide intervention training. What I'm saying is that it is not reducing suicidality and suicide rates. That's a fact. It's not Stefan saying this. Fridge magnets don't work, folks. When you're suicidal, you don't go to the fridge magnet. You don't, you know, I've been suicidal, but, and I've had suicidality, suicide thoughts, and all of this stuff. But when you're suicidal and you're about to kill yourself, 
you do not have that presence of mind of saying, wait a minute, I think I was given a fridge magnet by the corporation a few months ago, and I'll go call the 1-800 number. That is not an option, right? So what we've done is, is, is okay. It's not good enough. We need to push. We need to push. We need to turn the corner on this one. And we cannot kid ourselves in thinking that by issuing once a year, you know, corporate magnets to people on suicide lines and hotlines is, 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 is cutting it. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying we should stop doing that, but we can do much better. And I have a few ideas. Uh, two more messages before I, I, I go on to my speed dating PowerPoint presentation to bore you to death. Uh, when Chris said, you know, we don't train soldiers to come back home, I, I agree with that fully. In 2002, uh, as I was starting a program at National Defense that I'm not going to talk to you about, that's another presentation, I, I had a, a moment, 2001-2002, where I wrote our, our now CMP, at the time it was ADMHR Mill, it was another term, but it's the same position, Lieutenant uh, General uh, Christian Couture, and I said to him, I said, sir, I, 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 I have an, another idea. And th this guy was really great because he was one of those leaders who just, who, who can understand very broad concepts that are very innovative outside the box and has the leadership instinct of sorting out the wheat from the chaff and saying, I'm empowering that project and I'm not empowering this project. So this email basically said to him, I have an, another idea and I, I would like your support. And my idea was very simple. My idea was, I think we're doing a disservice to our troops by plucking them from their deployment location and throwing them back home. And I had made the case with him at the time that if we can spend $32 million you know, training a brigade group or a battle group to go overseas on a deployment like Afghanistan or anywhere else in the world, that we could certainly spend a few more dollars than a plane ticket to send people back home. And thus was born third location decompression. Now at the time, I remember being told by clinicians, no offense, but clinicians, doctors, Mark Zamorski, you know, the researchers, but Stefan, there's no evidence to show that third location decompression is going to impact in a positive way and mitigate the impact of PTSD. And my lay approach answer as an uneducated person was, well, show me the evidence that shows that it's not going to help. Now get out of our way, watch me now, we're doing this thing. And so third location decompression, of course, if it's not explained to families, will be seen as just an extension of the deployment where, darn, my family member, my spouse, my husband, my wife is not coming home. Now they're going to party in Cyprus for four days. Uh, I get that. But the value of not just being plucked from a theater of operation and thrown at home is huge, and we now have the empirical evidence that it does help. Mark Zamorski has studied this, has published, and we now know that it functions well. The military at that time decided to be innovative, decided to walk outside the beaten path of research and say, we're not going to use our people as guinea pigs, but we're going to do something different. And we now know it works, and our troops benefit and our families benefit from it. Uh, and that concept was very simple. I had come back from Rwanda after spending 11 months there. I came back on a civilian flight because I, I went there and came back four months out of sync with my rotation. I got extended over there. And when I came back, I, I went to the Ottawa airport. Uh, you know, I remember that should have been the first sign that I wasn't well, is I was so angry. I had all these, I was in civilian clothing, but I was so angry at these civilians stepping on me, getting their luggage because they were so in, they were in a hurry to get home. And I was building so much resentment to think, you're in a rush to get home, you know? And I had not told my wife I was coming home because I had been extended three times. So I thought, I'm going to stop telling my family I'm coming home because this is ridiculous, right? I'm just going to show up one day. Now, that was a mistake. That was not a smart move. Because I remember a taxi drops me off at home. I got my stuff. I leave everything in the snow there. And I, I rang the doorbell because who brings a key to your house when you, when you leave for six, seven, eight, nine, eleven months? And I, uh, right? You don't have to bring your house key, right? And 
the door opened, the kids were in their pajamas going to bed, and I, I collapsed. I, I fainted. And I didn't faint because I was tired. I keeled over because of the contrast. The contrast of, of over there, I'm over here. Now, the reality was so different. I hadn't seen a kid in a pajama in how many months, right? And, and the contrast, and that is where TLD was truly born that day. But it saw the light of day because a visionary leader allowed it to occur. Finally, the last comment I want to make before I go to the power plat. In French, we call it power plat because they're boring. Right, Veronique? <laughs> power plat. Uh, you talked about pain earlier, and I wanted to add to what Chris said. You know, I think the pain, you know, I think we, uh, who here has not had a bit of an anxiety thing on a roller coaster ride, and then you, you feel something physically, right? And I think that is not pain, but in a sense, you know, I always compare the physical pain of severe anxiety or the, the pain of, of PTSD like a 400 pound person sitting on your chest for three days, you know, and it hurts. The sternum hurts. The ribs, the rib cage at one point feels pain. Uh, head pain, not headaches, head pain. Just pain in the head. And it's not a headache where you take a Tylenol and it goes away, but pain, confusion, confusion is painful. I remember going in my garage sometimes, escaping, social activity at home. I was always the first one up from the table, go to do the dishes, you know, way to isolate, away from the chatter, the banter, the stupid conversations that I felt I had nothing to do with because this was stupid. We're talking about movies and stuff that are fun, but I didn't want to have fun and to feel too guilty. So you, who wants to have fun, right? So do the dishes, after the dishes, I'd go to the garage. And I remember standing in the garage saying, what, what do I do? Where do I go? I, I had nowhere to go. And the, the pain of confusion, of not knowing where you fit. Uh, so thanks for that question, because there's another frontier. What, what are the connections? And how can we address those? So shall I get into this presentation? Okay. So welcome. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for coming out. All right. So, uh, and uh, Kim just showed up. Hello, Kim. Kim is my associate, and she came in today uh, to, uh, well, we're going to have a meeting after. So thanks for showing up. Uh, so my, 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 my purpose here today is not to repeat everything Chris said, but you know what? I wish I was as uh, eloquent as he is, uh, and uh, I asked him if I could use his front cover because I think it, it's, it's so telling of his book. And uh, I'm going to start promoting his book. I'm not going to read it, Chris, because it's not good for me. But uh, I heard the, vi the, the verbal version, and I'm going to promote your book. Uh, but what I don't want to do is repeat what happens to us. But what I want to do is focus on how we can move as a society and address these issues. So to me, it's all about the non-clinical piece, because I am not a clinician, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist. It's that non-clinical piece, it's that human piece. It's our ability to rehumanize, in this particular case, workplaces. So, uh, I need to declare my conflict of interest, because I'm told by lawyers I need to do this. Uh, I now have two lives, well three lives, I'm a public speaker, check. But I have a company, uh, which is a social enterprise or a for-profit corporation. And at Mental Health Innovations, what we do is we go into workplaces, not bakeries with five employees, but large organizations, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, now a uh, contract with a company of 40,000 employees. And what we do there is we create actual programs, uh, real programs with policy, process, machinery to actually rehumanize the workplace and allow people to support each other in the workplace. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm also going to talk to you rapidly about the nonprofit <coughs> colleagues and I uh, founded, co-founded a few years ago to enable growth in a, 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 a capacity that we are severely lacking here in Canada, which is called peer support. 
and Kim is the executive director of that organization. So I volunteer my, ro my role as, as the chair of the board there, uh, but I try to make a living with mental health innovations. Uh, so let me start by telling you a little story. <laughs> And I put a photo there because as I tell you this story, you can look at the photo and say, ah, it's cool, he's having a ration with, uh, you know, and this is in the gorilla range, you know, uh, you, you, you were near there, right? That, uh, there. That's right. And, uh, you know, uh, Diane Fossey, her lab, for those of you who've seen Gorillas in the Mist, that's, that's right in that area, a heavily mined area at the time, in the early days of the aftermath of the war, and we were uh, going on some kind of a, a reconnaissance with uh, unmos and, and all of this, and we're taking a break here. Gorillas are fascinating, by the way, but that's not the point of the story. The story is Halifax, Nova Scotia. I'm in Halifax a few years ago to do, go do yet another talk, another keynote speech, and I get into the elevator to go to my room, check into my room, and my plan that evening is to put my luggage down, go for a pizza, and chill, and then go do my keynote the next morning. In walks two women, and I'm not saying two women because I'm sexist, it, it's fact, it was two women. They walk in the elevator, and they're having a conversation. And the conversation goes as follows. One says to the other, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, let's say Natalie. Okay, we're talking about Natalie. So, you know, Natalie's back at work. The other woman says, yeah, I heard, yeah, I heard, I heard. Uh, she wasn't well. No, she wasn't. And the conversation goes on, and we're going up the elevator. And in, this, in, in, the, in the time it takes to go from the lobby to the 11th floor of the hotel, they have this very meaningful conversation about Natalie, the third person. And the epiphany for me is that one of the women says to the other, I knew she was not well. I saw this coming, this train wreck happening in front of my eyes for about six months. And when she came back from her sick leave, back at work, I went to see her and I told her, we all knew you were sick. And the elevator door opened, and I walked out, and I thought, you knew she was sick. What did you do about it? You're telling me you knew? It was obvious? And I walked out, and I followed my plan. I went for a beer and a pizza, and I delivered my keynote the next day. But the point is, that is totally unacceptable. If you know that today, in front of you, I trip in this wire and I sprain my ankle, and none of you, you all sit there staring at me, wondering how I'm going to get up, and I struggle back up, to, and I'm clearly in pain, and nobody offers me a chair or some ice, or are you okay? Chris doesn't stand up to say, let's take a five-minute break. Who the heck would tolerate that? None of us. You would be offended that the organizers of the event let me keel over and, and just struggle for the rest of my keynote. But we let it happen every single day for mental health problems. Why is that acceptable? And I'll tell you why later. Well, it's not. So I'm not going to tell you why. But... Here's, here's a couple of stats. I'm going to fast forward through these because this, this is important. It's context, but you can read these later. 2008, depression, Canada, costing Canada 30 billions in lost productivity. Check. You can look at that later. Sources in the bottom. 2010, Center for Addiction and Mental Health does a similar study here. Looks at the entire cost in lost productivity in Canada alone for all mental health problems. And as you can see, I'm not focusing on PTSD, no offense, but this is, this is larger. Mental health issues are much broader in Canada than PTSD. $51 billion in lost productivity. You tell me workplaces don't have a stake in fixing this problem? They do, and they're starting to realize that. The problem is they don't know what to do because they all have EAP problem, they all have EAP programs, and, you know, they have management training once in a while. They have a guy with a suit and a briefcase and a plane ticket coming in once a year to do an anti-stigma briefing. And they think, oh, we issue fridge magnets. So there you go. We issue fridge magnets. That's good. And it's still, the costs are rising, right? So when I created my company, I said, we need to innovate. We need to do something new. We need to, do, we need to turn the corner on this, so I call the company Mental Health Innovations. Uh, payroll costs, 4 to 12 percent, it's another way to calculate disability costs. Large, large amount of people, you know, don't feel safe coming forward. People don't know how to deal with these issues. 
you know, the vast majority of people are not well, but they don't seek treatment. And Chris talked about that earlier. And I'm going to fast track through this. Claims are skyrocketing. You've heard the stats. In the public service alone, I'm not sure in Ontario, but in Canada, federal public service, I think 43% or 47% of all disability claims are mental health alone. Not cardiovascular, not diabetes, not mental health, depression, burnout. Few words about stigma now. Stigma, the S word. Um, you know, I think that we have a false sense of security out there when we allow ourselves, you know, in organizations to say, well, yeah, you know, stigma, we need to talk about this. And it's good to talk about this. I'm for talking. Jeez, I talk, I'm talking to you today. I'm talking. But that's not how you beat stigma. It's not by briefing people. It's not by inviting guys like me with a suit and tie or even Chris to have a briefing because that doesn't stick, doesn't stick long. It might have a tremendous impact with people who get it, people who, who Chris, by his words, will enable that conversation to be had. And those are really powerful examples. But I firmly believe that that is not how you eradicate societal stigma because afterwards we, we, we go back to what we're faced with. Uh, uh, a slurry of emails, uh, employees that are presenting somewhat behavioral issues, performance issues. Is it a symptom? Is it a behavior? Is it, is it, is he just lazy? I'm not sure. I'm busy. I don't know what to do. How do I address the conversation? And then you just go back to your reality. Reality now is that things are happening fast. We're all so busy. The kids are all in soccer and hockey. We don't have time. We don't have time for people. And so, to me, stigma right now is being kind of addressed by giving lectures and, and uh, courses, briefings, and that's a start. To me, it's the equivalent of suicide intervention training. It has to happen, but a lot more needs to be done as well. I attended, uh, you remember the Stephen Covey thing that uh, you had organized at LFCA? So Chief of Staff, LFCA, that was a good idea. I learned a few things there. The reality is, though, you attend a Stephen Covey time management seminar, and you're fired up after, aren't you? You're fired up, and you think, Jesus, I'm going to manage my time differently now. <clears throat> Within a week, I think you've lost 80% of your thrust and your desire to really make true transformational change in the way you manage your time. Why? Because reality hits. And so it's stigma. I think that a Stephen Covey briefing is good. It will get you on the track, but unless you sustain that kind of philosophy and that, right? I'm not saying you failed as chief of staff. I, you know, he, he was my boss at LFC. I'm picking on him, but I'm giving that as an example that, you know, it's not a bad thing, but if we really have a problem with time management, a Stephen Covey seminar just might not cut it. You might need a little more traction there. And so, same for stigma. So a few words about stigma. I mean, the reality, yeah, this is a good friend of mine. This is in Rwanda, by the way. This is Rick Noseworthy. He has, you know, this is a photo, by the way, that appeared in the Washington Post after Rick had a terrible day. Now, I use this picture with his permission. Never contacted the journalist in the Washington Post to get permission, but I'm not making money off of this picture, so I guess you turn me in if you need to. I wrote him an email. He never responded. I tried. But that is a very graphic representation of somebody having a real bad day. Real bad day. And Rick did not pose for this picture. But when we see lesser examples of this in our workplaces, how many of us just walk by we kind of have this thing in our gut to say, I, do I, how you do it? I don't have time. I always wanted to run a sociological experiment at D&D when I was a di director casualty support management, especially in those days where I was suicidal. Not the day, not after I, I tried to hang myself and Julie walked in on me, but I remember one evening you know, I call it chewing on the end of a shotgun for a while, you know. And I always wanted to run the sociological experiment, but never mustered the courage 
of challenging the normal conversation we have in our workplace, which is you come into your workplace, you push on the button there to get the elevator, you're going up to your office, somebody you know, an acquaintance comes over and says, oh, hi, Stefan, how you doing? I always wanted to say, well, a lot better this morning because last night I was chewing on the end of a shotgun and I almost shot my head off. <coughs> to see what the reaction would be. But I never mustered the courage to be that cynical about the artificiality of our human interactions at work, which is, how you doing, Chris? Good. You, Steph? Good. Have a good day. Boom. That's it. That's the extent. Now, that's at the elevator shaft, and I get that, that we were all going to work. But we see, remember Natalie, the Halifax story. They all saw, but they all walked by. We don't ask. We're not comfortable asking, do we have time for the answer, right? And so those are elements of stigma. This here is a very interesting study. I'm not going to go too, too long in explaining to you the meaning of this. But one thing I want to really impact on, by the way, just to you know, uh, look at these numbers, Total number of people uh, checked out on this study was over 6,000 people. These happened to be troops coming back from Iraq. The no MD on the right column are people who answered the entire survey, the health survey and the post-deployment survey, uh, that included enough questions to be able to tease out who amongst the respondents of this survey likely had PTSD or depression after deployment. And the MD is uh, who likely had a medical diagnosis or a mental health diagnosis. And the no medical diagnosis are the ones that likely did not have a problem based on the survey responses. Does that make sense? Okay, so they ask a bunch of questions to 6,000 people. Those questions are about their health, their mental health, about perceptions, very important perceptions. And they have the ability to tease out who's likely sick and who's not. This is a groundbreaking study because for the first time in history, really, we now can see how people with mental health problems perceive certain things, such as if you ask a healthy person, you know, so if you had a mental health problem in your workplace, do you think it could harm your career? Well, the ones who did not have a medical diagnosis, 24% of them said, yeah, I think it could harm my career. Now, look at in the ones who have a likely medical diagnosis. The perceptions are significantly different, leading me to introduce the concept of self-stigma. There is stigma that, you know, one can be imposed. There is the look, there's the body language, there's, yeah, fucking Chris, yeah, Chris, yeah, whatever. Uh, you know, there's the look. You don't have to say anything to be stigmatizing. Body language. I always say that people like Chris and I, perhaps, and statistically, there's one out of five of you in the room who have this issue. Statistically, we're really good bullshit detectors. You don't have to tell me anything. I can read you like a book, and I know exactly what you think. And on top of it, I might imagine what you think. If I'm not well, you might want to help me, but how will I interpret that help? How does a manager call somebody out of the goodness of his or her heart who's on sick leave, burnt out, depressed, really wanting to authentically connect with the employee and just say, how are you? I, I was just wondering, how are you doing? How do you do that? without leading the person to perceive that they're being bullied or forced back at work early or spied upon or wondering, what are you calling me to you know, turn off my benefits? Do you want me to come back to work early? The point is, is that sometimes in our workplaces, in our systems, in society, we mean well, but the perceived, the way we perceive that help being handed out is critical. And unless large organizations and society understands that, we will continue to miss a very important point, which is I'm going to get to later. This is a sales pitch, by the way. You're all be, you'll all be buying some of this later. <coughs> I go on. So what happens? Well, I think that stigma, you know, the lack of knowledge, 
leads us to believe, you know, some people say the biggest barrier to mental health care is stigma. Well, according to some study, it ain't stigma. It's actually the lack of ability of someone to recognize that they need help. If I break a leg, my leg is broken, my brain will tell me, your leg is broken, go see the doctor. Go get your leg fixed. What if my brain is not functioning well? The very part of my human anatomy that can tell me, go get help, is the piece that needs help and the piece that's I arguably broken. Very difficult. So according to some studies, the 80% of people who don't get help, don't get help, not because they're ashamed, they could be ashamed as well, but the most important reason, they don't even know they need help. And so stigma takes many, many forms. There's the outward stigma, there's a lack of knowledge, there's self-stigma, the perception issue. So this is a lot larger than, you know, well, I think people with mental health are lazy. Yes, that's stigma, but it's a lot larger than that. And of course, that leads to guys like Chris and I, where you just suck it up, you don't get treatment. I flushed so many of your pills, and I say your pills because you pay your tax dollars, paid for my medication. <laughs> And I would go back home, and I was, I'm not taking these, you know? And so I stayed ill. I stayed sick because I was trying to go into treatment, but I wasn't being treatment compliant because, one, you know, I'm just a lay person. I have no idea what happened in that session with my doctor. Next thing I know, I'm walking out the pharmacy with a brown bag with a bunch of pills. What the heck? I'm not taking these, and I wasn't sleeping. And I wasn't going to take pills because of everything Chris said and all of that. And so you stay sick. And the longer you stay sick, the more treatment resistant you become, which increases our tax dollar costs, not only for the military, but for the healthcare system as a whole. Because that's what happens in the military, but that's what happens society wide. And I know you know this, but I got to make the point. This is not a military issue. It is. But mental health problems is an epidemic in this country, and we need to turn the corner. So a couple of things ab about me very briefly. Joined in 83, released last year, 29 years in the military. I, I, I quit. I, I quit early. I couldn't keep going. I became you know, very allergic to the institution. I, I, it, was, it was like a, a, a rash. I, I just couldn't anymore. So I left. Not bitter. Not twisted, but there's a very deliberate reason why I have not focused on military issues in the last three years, because I'm moving on. I'm moving on, and I think you're doing the same thing, and I am not bitter. And Chris invited me here today, and I'm happy to come here today. Uh, but I want to talk to you about the encounters with support. Number one, right after Rwanda, and encounter number two, down here. And what my encounters were, were serendipitous encounters with something I knew nothing about, which is my whole point for having accepted to come here today, to pitch you a new innovative concept. What I bumped into between 94 and 96, when I was flushing those pills down the toilet, was a colleague, another captain at the time, Mike Arsenault. Mike Arsenault and I had done our, our, our uh, airborne course together in Edmonton <coughs> years before, in the uh, mid-80s. And Mike had been to Sarajevo in the first Van Du rotation into Bosnia. Then a few years later, I come back from Rwanda. He and I are working together. And he's the first individual to say, hey, Steph, uh, are, you, are you okay? Now, instinctively, you know, Mike's not a doctor, he's a Van Du. He's a Francophone Van Du. But he's the first human being, even ahead of my wife, to say, Steph, you okay, buddy? In French, of course, right? And then he and I had a bit of a dialogue, you know, an awkward dialogue, but we were good, good friends, so it was not as awkward as it could have been if it would have been the chief of staff at that time, right? But. We had a dialogue, and then rapidly he said, well, Jesus, Steph, you know, you're not sleeping, man. It's obvious. you got sleep in your eyes. You're crabby all the time. You, you piss off the major every day. I mean, at one point, he's going to pull you aside to write you up. I mean, this is ridiculous. You can't be insubordinate this way. I'm, I got your back. He said, uh, by the way, when I came back from Sarajevo, I was a mess. 
And so uh, I, I hadn't slept, and I, I saw this doctor, and he gave me some pills, and you know, I, uh, I'm sleeping now. He, might, he gave me the courage to actually go to NDMC, right? I won't get into the whole story, but I got the pills. But then I went home and I flushed the pills down the toilet. A few weeks later, Mike says, did you go see the doc? I said, yeah, yeah, I did, Mike. And he said, well, oh, are the pills, are you getting sleep now? Did you, did you get some sleeping pills? You need to sleep. And I said, yeah, yeah, Mike, but that uh, pills. And the dialogue that we had there was very critical in my recovery because Mike basically told me in very unkind words, by the way, words that I will not repeat here, the polite version is, what the hell's wrong with you? You're not sleeping. You have access to health care. It's free. You got sleeping pills. You're not taking them. Are you stupid? And I will skip everything else in between because francophones are very animated when they talk and they curse a lot. And I started taking my meds. What, what happened there? Number two, encounter number two is with that man right over here. Years later, I show up working for Chris Corrigan. I'm a complete mess. I, uh, I don't know if you ever noticed, but sometimes I didn't come in very early. Uh, and uh, the reason for, I don't think I ever told Chris, but the reason for this is I was taking the subway from Etobicoke to Young and Finch, and I would snap out of it in the middle of Young Street when I was supposed to be in the subway because, a bit like Chris, you know, I had been kind of stared at a little too much by a big black person or something like that, and I left Rwanda on not so good terms. I had death threats from the Ramon Patriotic Army because I was a spokesperson there and uh, the, the UN you know, refused to send me home because we were making a point, so I was kind of a pawn in this whole political game. At the end of the day though, you know, Chris pulled me aside and basically the message he said to me that day was, I forget the exact words, but the message I received was, Stefan, you're, 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 you know, with your armored background and your purse file, I can see that you're a pretty solid officer. But the person that's here right now doesn't seem to be the same guy that is articulated in, in your file, in your records. You probably had a rough time in Rwanda. I care. I care. I would really like it if you got help. And I don't want to know, I don't want to have details, this is your life, but I want you to know I care. He gave me permission to look after myself. Did I need permission? No. I did not need permission from Chris Corrigan to go see a doctor. We know that, right? But culturally, culturally, the vice president or the chief of staff, whatever you call Chris, in the civilian equivalent, the culture of my organization had said, look after yourself, my friend. Take all the time you need. Your job is safe. All I care is that you get healthy again. And I want the guy I read in the purse file to show up here at work one day. Take as long as you want. That freedom, the no pressure, the caring, the humanized approach was encounter number two. And so that is what Kim and I and so many of our colleagues are now cloning inside large workplaces. And I'll tell you about it in a few minutes. The last thing I want to say here on this slide is there is no cure for this, but recovery is very real and it is very possible. That's recovery. This is recovery. And I know some people in the room personally they're recovered. They're not at home, in bed, sucking on their thumb, watching Oprah all day. People are inherently good. People are inherently not lazy. Recovery is not about curing. It's about being able to be able again. And so what does that require? And I will quote Romeo Dallaire. And if you want to read his quote, go on the nonprofit site where it says recovery for him and so many of us is like a three-legged stool. 
A good clinician and good therapy, some medication, and what's the third leg? Peers, peer support, <coughs> systemically. Chris referred to it as community. Community is cool if you bump into it serendipitously. What we do now in our organizations is we actually enable organizations to not allow serendipitous connections bumping into peer support, but actually making it formal programs, service delivery of support. So a few things I'd like to share with you as well to just maybe get you to think of these issues in a slightly different way, through a different lens perhaps. Uh, because my big shtick for the last 14 years now has been, you know, if you're a clinician, and you know, Chris is perhaps a good example of somebody who was very close to that clinical world, uh, and despite his proximity to the clinical world, you can see that his recovery was still a challenge. And so what about, and I'm not saying I, I have a worse case, but what about people who aren't connected to the clinical world? What about people who, when they get diagnosed, they have no reference point whatsoever for diagnostic language? What is the impact? I'm going back to soldiering now. What is the impact on a soldier when they get diagnosed with the illness or the disease called post-traumatic stress disorder. Ever think about the meaning of disorder in a military environment now? It's ironic to me that the term PTSD was invented, coined, written about in the DSM, right? Back in 1983, I believe, the DSM is the Bible for psychiatrists. The term was born out of that experience of tens of thousands of Vietnam veterans coming back from Vietnam being messed up. And some smart aleck decided to call that problem a disorder for a military population. How dysfunctional is that? How thoughtless is that? If I had a dollar for every soldier I met who just couldn't muster the understanding of what was wrong with them based on the word disorder, my mortgage would be paid. I coined the term stress injury for a couple of reasons. One, it was not to impact the medical literature. That was not a medical term. It was a term for the military culture. And the purpose of that was to create a bridge in people's minds that you know, it's not a disease. I know that's the reference point. That's what we commonly understand. But it's not a disease. It's not a disorder. You're having a rough patch. Now, clinically, it might be a disorder. Go see your... Right? Fine. I don't want to impact that. But culturally, I wanted us in the military to have another non-clinical reference point for this problem. And now in civilian workplaces, I'm very lazy. I didn't want to change the slide too much, so I call it occupational stress injury. Right? Same term, same reason. And the reason why I put injury in red, and by the way, in 2013, I had many, many, many psychiatrists coming to me to say, Stefan, you're wrong. You cannot call this an injury. We have no empirical evidence to show that the brain is actually altered. Dr. Ruth Lanius now has brain imagery showing that the brain is indeed altered. So I don't want to be a bit of a smart ass here today, but I was right. It is an injury. The brain is altered. If you hit me with a two by four, my bones snap. There's something that happened there. We now have brain imagery that shows that the brain is altered. Nor here nor there, however. The injury term was there to stress the importance of decomplicating, demedicalizing this issue. Because we lay people, and I'm assuming there's a lot of lay people like me, non-clinicians in the room, we, I can deal with an injury. You know, uh, go back to the sprained ankle analogy. You don't need to be a doctor to get some ice and put some ice on my sprained ankle here and, and pull a chair and say, are you okay? I've been injured. Now, if I step on a landmine and I lose a foot, the level of support I get is going to be important, but that clinical intervention is absolutely critical, right? 
quick clot and the tourniquet, that works for a certain amount of time. And then you got to amputate and you got to do the right stuff. But the term injury is there to actually empower people at the most basic levels of society and workplaces to understand that, well, wait a minute here. You know, maybe, maybe Chris needs to see a doctor, but Chris is a human being too. And why don't I ask Chris how the heck he is? You know, maybe that's the equivalent of putting ice on it or offering a chair. We can support people who have mental health problems. We have just been, I guess, socialized in a country, in a workplace where these things are so complicated that we all have, unbeknownst to ourselves, abdicated our responsibility to our fellow co-workers and our managers today. What do they do when they have an employee who's suffering? They find a way to give the EAP pamphlet to that employee in a way where they're not going to offend the employee, hoping that the employee is going to call the EAP and get some level of help because we've just lost that habit of asking people how the heck they're doing and sticking around for the answer. So I'm really dumbing all this down, but the term injury was coined for that very reason. And as you can see, it's stuck. Veterans Affairs Canada calls their clinics operational stress injury clinics. I never had dreamed that. And now in the U.S., uh, they're actually researching this whole phenomenon, which I find really, really cool. And they're actually researching the last bubble on my slide there, which is moral conflict. Now, this slide here is just to, and th this is, this is um, a way for me, uh, and I know we talked a lot about trauma this morning, but this is a way for me to now get your minds away from trauma. We, we a society, understand trauma. So you had a good example of military, you know, Chris talked about the guys firing over the wall and killing and dying and all that. That's, that's you get trauma. Mauled by a wolf, trauma. Single largest cause of PTSD in the civilian population here in Canada is rape. Rape, never been raped, but that must not be good. That is traumatizing. That is the single most important cause in Canada of trauma and PTSD today. Uh, mauled by a car accident. We get trauma. Let's move away from trauma now. Fatigue. These are the causes of stress injuries from a lay perspective, not a clinical perspective, although clinicians and researchers are researching this today in the States, not in Canada. We're kind of loosey-goosey when it comes to this in Canada. Fatigue. Fatigue, cumulative wear and tear on people. Do more work. Here's a Blackberry, and it can work 24-7 now, right? There's no, there's no real flipping point. There's no tipping point for fatigue, isn't there? People keel over, become burnt out, rarely due to a very specific event incident like a trauma, like a rape, like a car accident, like being mauled by a wolf. Trauma is, to some extent, understa understandable and easy to deal with to some degree because there's a police report, there's an incident, there's a date, there's a time, there's a... Oh, like, you know, like Chris and I have these videos sometimes playing in my head about this particular incident. And as difficult as it is, you can wrap your mind around that. But somebody in the civilian workplace who simply keels over at one point, burnt out, severely depressed and having a hard time getting up in the morning, what's their excuse? They didn't see anybody die. Did they get raped? No. But we now know that the cumulative wear and tear on people does accumulate to actually keeling people over despite any presence of any trauma. Grief, third cause. Rapidly, this is speed dating today. Grief, I'll ask you to open your, your minds and understand or look at grief from a slightly different perspective than death. We understand grieving death, but I'm just gonna ask you to look at grief from a larger perspective, which is a sense of loss. The best example of a civilian workplace around sense of loss, when I gave a presentation to the Canadian Auto Workers uh, Union a few years back, the women's advocates for that uh, particular union, this uh, lady says, if I understand you correctly, Stefan, what you're talking about here might have happened to me. And her example was such a great example. She says, I, I was the executive assistant uh, in a law firm working in a small team, you know, in the 16th floor versus the 57th floor of that law firm or whatnot. And she said, we had such a good team. Our, our boss, the lawyer, 
was the greatest man we had ever worked for. He was human. He was approachable. He was always available. He was, he was so empowering. He wasn't a micromanager. He's just like that, that, that perfect manager, that perfect boss. Worked for him for seven years. Then he gets promoted, becomes a partner, goes up to the 53rd floor. And she said, and I'm repeating this, this is my alibi. She said, we inherited the organizational asshole as the team boss. So I, after I recovered from my shock about such a lovely, distinguished lady saying the word asshole, I said, that's exactly it. That's grief. That's grief in a non-death scenario. Now, I'm not saying that, and she didn't say that, that moment led me to depression uh, and a diagnosis and 15 years of recovery. No. These are ingredients that sometimes combine, sometimes in isolation, will cause somebody to keel over, right? Finally, moral conflict. Moral conflict in a very graphic way is being in Rwanda during the war, seeing women with babies on their backs, killing other women uh, with baby on their back, uh, and uh, the rules of engagement, chapter six, can't do anything about it, and have to kind of decide, well, I'm too far, uh, even if I run there, it's not, but there's something else happening over there. I just got to ignore this. That's a very graphic way. The more academic way to explain this is perhaps when what you're asked to do or what you're asked not to do conflicts with your own sense of right and wrong, with your own moral beliefs, and that happens daily in our workplaces here in Canada. Not in a graphic, traumatizing way, perhaps, but daily. And so it is not a single moment, a single thing that your boss asks you to do on a Tuesday. Again, that keels people over. But think about this. Think about this. Think about the perfect storm now. And maybe take trauma out of that equation. A lot of moral conflict, a bit of grief, some fatigue, accumulates 15 years later, you keel over, there's no reason why, and people wonder, well, what's, what the hell's wrong with Kim or Natalie? We all saw it coming. She wasn't behaving the same. Who asked her how she was doing, right? Very difficult for civilian workplaces to actually grasp these concepts, and that's what I think we're on, we're on the trail of helping them address. I only present evidence that proves I'm right. This is a very... Uh, you know, precipitating study. Evidence that demonstrates that I'm wrong in my theories and what I do for a living now, I completely ignore. This study I love. A psychiatrist, good friend of mine, put this slide together for me after repeatedly sending me this literature that I read and read and read and could not comprehend. And I said, Don, you're going to have to make this easy. Draw me a picture. He drew this slide, and I've been using this for 14 years. Well, since 2000. Basically, this is really challenging some of our beliefs. Maybe not your beliefs. I normally speak to the converted. If you're here today, it's because you care enough to be here and you probably don't need to learn any of this stuff. Instinctively, you probably have the fabric that makes you somebody who can make a difference like Chris did for me. That's why you're here. I rarely talk to the people who are really part of the problem. But those who are part of the problem, if you look at my example, well, I come back from Rwanda, I'm not doing well, it's kind of obvious. And this will explain what people probably were thinking at the time in trying to answer, why is Grenier so messed up after Rwanda? You know, like, well, we saw the stuff on TV, it wasn't pretty, but is everybody sick? Why Chris? So, this study looked at risk factors. It looked at why when some people, or wow, if we got all exposed to the same situation, why would some people develop this problem and others not? Now, you had a question earlier, sir, about you know uh, sociopaths and all this. I was told by a, uh, a very re reputable uh, psychiatrist in Vancouver, uh, Greg Passy, who said once, he said, the only way to create military forces completely immune to PTSD is create battalions of psychopaths. You create a battalion of 800 soldiers who are psychopaths. You have completely immunized that battalion to post-traumatic stress disorder. The risk factors are complex. They're multifactorial. But here are some of the highlights from that literature. 
So the question is, why did Grenier become so sick after Rowan or Chris? Is it because perhaps he was depressed as a child? Maybe Stefan had depression in high school. Maybe he was bullied, you know? And that would have eroded his ability to be resilient after Rwanda. Ah, that's why he's so ill. What about, I bet your childhood abuse had something to it. Maybe Steph's dad beat him up when he was a kid. Again, eroding his resiliency, making him more vulnerable to developing this problem. Now, the slide here shows that all these are factors you can see by the graph. But what Chris Bruin established in this very important piece of literature is that the most important piece that makes people at risk is not what happened to them before, not even the trauma severity itself. They're all factors. Look at it as a stew. A stew is a bunch of ingredients that come in to make a dish. But in all stews or recipes, there's one or two elements that stick out a lot more. If it's a beef stew, I'm assuming it's beef. The elements here that stick out the most are elements that we actually can control. They are 100% controllable, especially in workplaces. The last one is the lack of social support. Chris talked about his desire to isolate. I isolated. I isolated at work. Natalie was isolating in that Halifax story. Everybody saw it coming, yet nobody approached Natalie. A few people approached me. But I would have necessitated a larger dose of social support in order to not become so sick. This, if addressed, is actually a preventative factor. So very simply put, folks, my theory for the last 13, 14 years or such has been, before this study was even, that's what was missing for me. I wonder if we can find a way to clone this. And my theory has been very simple. If the lack of social support is the most predominant risk factor in predicting who will develop these problems, then what if we found a way to infuse social support as the antidote? So what can be done and how can it be done? I'm coming in for a landing here. We're almost done, folks. And then we can have lunch, right? We have caviar coming. Yes, Chris? No caviar? I haven't paid for it. Oh, okay. No caviar. Sorry. That's the next meeting. No, I'm joking. So what can be done? Till today, or till recently, or right now, the current modus operandi in most institutions, large organizations, remember now, I'm talking workplaces, right? This is my shtick now, uh, is that, you know, we see things through a clinical lens. We have psychiatrists, social workers, psychologists coming in, setting up you know, programs and all this, and that's all good stuff. It is all good stuff. I love my clinicians. I, 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 I take my pills most of the time, when I, except when I forget, and I forgot this morning, uh, but I'm good. I'm, good. I'm, I'm on a half dose, so I take pills every second day, so I can skip a day every once in a while. So Kim, watch out. I'll be on hyperdrive this afternoon. Kim is laughing. Uh, but basically, we, as a society, as workplaces, we see this issue as a clinical matter, not as a leadership issue. And therefore, we, we put all our energy and strength around the clinical intervention. And that's not a bad thing. And we cannot lose traction on this. Whatever advancements have been made in the clinical field has to remain. Now, remember my analogy of the sprained ankle, the broken leg, the, you know, you lose a foot. Mental ill health, by the way, occurs on a spectrum, no different than physical injuries uh, or problems. And, you know, my, my big thing in the military when I was still there, setting up, by the way, the, uh, the road to mental readiness with, uh, with the, the team there, uh, our shtick was leadership is hugely important, especially around mental health. Now, you're going to say, well, how does that, you know, how, how does that come to life? Well, again, this is speed dating. The only version I'm going to give you is, it's very easy to understand. If I'm a platoon commander and I take my 30 soldiers on a run one morning and one soldier sprains an ankle, I'm not a doctor, but my decision that moment will either send the person from the yellow zone to the orange zone, in other words, compounding the injury, or my actions on the field that very day will help the person return to that healthy zone, that green zone, a lot faster. I can choose to say, keep running, stop complaining. I didn't hear any bone snap, keep running. Now, 30 years ago, that was kind of the way we were doing things, to suck it up. 
our leadership now is starting to understand, wait a minute, there's, yeah, maybe it's not a good idea. If the leader actually says, hey, you and you, pick up Natalie, bring her to the, you know, bring her to the shacks, put some ice on it. If it really swells up, you might want to go to the MIR, the clinic, right? But our leadership instincts at the coal phase makes a huge difference. And so why should it be so different for mental health? It's not. So what we are doing right now in Canada, one workplace at a time, is adding that social component on top of that clinical one, not to replace it as a complement, as the third leg on that stool, as says Romeo Dallaire. Go check it out. It's on the website. So speed dating wise, I'll keep going. Uh, how do we do this? Very simply put, we engage the one in five. For those of you who attend conferences, briefings on mental health in Canada, you will be told time and time again, one in five people suffer from a mental health condition. Bell Canada is just about to launch their Let's Talk. You will hear every day for about a week, one in five Canadians suffer from a mental health problem. Yeah, and do we ever talk to those people? No, because we don't know how to talk to these people. So what we do when we go in a workplace, we actually find these people, we engage them and we make them part of the solution. And you're thinking, well, that's cruel. You're telling me, Stefan, that you're actually going to the sick people in workplaces and you're asking them to do more? Aren't you going to burn people out? No, we don't. It is very empowering to give purpose to this lived experience. You get something out of it by helping somebody else, by paying it forward. And if I, again, if I had a dollar for every time I heard that, my mortgage would be paid. And so we address the most prominent factor, which is lack of social support, by creating peer support programs in workplaces, allowing now the workplace to do on a macro scale what Chris happened to do to me, which is the institution is giving me permission and they actually care. When Kim and I you know, launch a program, uh, we have, we decided that we, you know, this is a long process. We create the program, we write the policies. This is not just, hey, Chris, you look like a nice guy. Why don't you start helping people in the workplace? And by the way, uh, do it between midnight and six because we don't really have a program. No, these are formal programs with policy, process, machinery. And what happens is that when we go through the whole process, we select people, those who are selected come for training, those who aren't selected because sometimes they're not the right fit. Kim and I call those people, right? So we don't want to pit the workplace against each other. So the successful candidates get called by the corporation. Kim and I call the people who we say, listen, we're not retaining your name for this training. You know, maybe the guy is not a nice person. We don't say it that way, but we basically let them down easy. We say, well, peer support might not be for you, right? What I hear, and I'm not sure if Kim hears that, what I hear is that, oh, I'm just happy the workplace is doing this. I can't believe the VP of HR is actually launching this program. This is exactly what I needed. And then I, oh, well, thanks a lot. Okay, well, they wish us luck. They're happy. They're not pissed off that they weren't selected. They might be. But their first response is, I just can't believe the workplace is actually doing this. What are they doing? They're giving permission for people to be authentic with each other, have an ability to connect people at a very human level, not a pity party, this is not turning a workplace into a social club, but allowing people to connect with each other, give them meaningful support, and allow the workplace to transform from within. That's how you address stigma, from within, by engaging the one in five. So what is this called? It's called peer support. On a spectrum, peer support is not friendship. It's not clinical care. It's what happens in between. Now, again, this is speed dating, right? What we do is we focus on that more formal end of peer support. Peer support happens all over the place. It happens if it's not friendship and it's not clinical care and it's a meaningful conversation between two human beings, you can call that peer support, especially if it's mental health. However, what we focus on is the formal end of the spectrum because workplaces, I don't think, can just say, hey, Bob, uh, Natalie, you seem like nice people. Why don't you go help people randomly? That's not a program. So what we focus in is making sure that the company, the organization, has a strategic solution to the lack of social support, and that's through programming. So, you know, to, to re-emphasize the conflict of interest, I do have two lives. 
Uh, one is with Peer Support Accreditation Certification Canada, who have developed what is, to me, a, 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 a worldwide piece of, 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 of blueprint. These are the standards of practice for peer support. Now, in a lot of countries, Australia, New Zealand, England, Canada, uh, there's peer support training. That's addressing the knowledge piece, training. Most organizations will have a code of conduct. Um, you know, experience and competencies, to me, have been the weakest link. The competencies of peer support are, are not, to my knowledge, something that existed pre-PSAC Canada. If they do send it to me, I'll look at it for sure. We had never seen competencies. We had never seen the behavioral indicators of how you evaluate competencies around peer support. So when we implement the program, we use the PSAC Canada standards of practice. At the tail end, number four, we also refer our clients to the evaluation platform set up for the sole purpose of program evaluation of peer support. Not general surveys around mental health and the efficacy of what their workplace is doing, loosey-goosey, specific evaluation of peer support programs. And in between, this is where mental health innovation does its work, where we provide everything from policy, process, and communication, selection, and, and training. So that's the roadmap to implementation. These are some of the deliverables. This is the platform, the PSAC Canada platform, blah, 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 blah. My sales pitch is done. But the point is, folks, uh, we can do a lot more than talk about mental health, although I'm always happy to talk about it. I now have the luxury of working with workplaces who truly have visionary leaders who are on behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying thank you for joining us by podcast. We look forward to having you with us for future events, whether via internet or, we hope, in person. Either way, thanks for being with us, and goodbye for now.